And um, Campbell walks in with a lawyer from the Discovery Institute and says, we withdraw our claim. Campbell dropped off uh, out of the suit just as he was about to be deposed. This was a big surprise to our legal team. And frankly, very soon thereafter, other defense witnesses began dropping like the proverbial small insects. Um, <laughs> Uh, Bill Densky dropped out next. Um, uh, uh, Steve Meyer uh, dropped out, uh, uh, claiming that he had no confidence in the uh, Thomas More Law Institute, which was the religious right-oriented legal institution defending the, the uh, case. Um, and uh, Warren Moore was scheduled, was deposed, and was scheduled to testify during the trial, but never, never was put on the stand. Um, uh, Mr. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah, Carpenter, pardon me. <laughs> I just don't know his name. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, we understood, was there in Harrisburg, you know, ready to be put on the stand, but the lawyers never put him on the stand. So basically, the um, this is the case of the incredible disappearing witnesses. Uh, the only expert witnesses that the defense put on was Scott Minnick, Bill, uh, uh, Michael Behe, and uh, Steve Fuller. Uh, by the way, John Angus Campbell has uh, subsequently moved to uh, Washington State, where he is now running for the local school board. <laughs> Interestingly enough, if you Google John Angus Campbell, you will get uh, pages full of professional work. He has a, a large uh, publication record, and he is very well known as John Angus Campbell. In his um, school board suit, he is uh, running as John Campbell, not even John R. Campbell. And um, uh, there is no mention whatsoever about uh, his books on intelligent design or his association with the Discovery Institute. All of his campaign materials are scrubbed completely clean of any sort of uh, association. Possibly the citizens at North Mason might wonder if it's a good idea to elect a school board member who served as an expert, who was, was to serve as an expert witness for a school district that did something highly illegal. That's their decision. We don't get into politics. One of the very interesting things that happened during the Dover trial was um, in searching through NCSE archives, we found some old references and some old creation science literature about the writing of pandas and people, or what we thought was going to become pandas and people, and the people associated with it. It was uh, Foundation for Thought and Ethics and Buell, and the, you know, this sounds like it's going to be pandas and people, but the titles of these books back in the early 90s, in the mid sorry, early and mid-1980s were very creation-sounding titles. So we mentioned this to the lawyers. And the lawyers that afternoon subpoenaed any early manuscripts of pandas and people from the Foundation for Thought and Ethics. I would have loved to have been a fly on that wall when that subpoena came in, because I have a feeling that FTE knew at that point the jig was up, and I'll tell you why. So of course, to their credit, they sent us the manuscripts. Of course, the first thing we did was we scanned them. Now, I'm sorry for the, for the detail here, but this is relevant. There's a really good punchline, so hang in there. <laughs> Down here on the x-axis, as we say in the scientific biz, we have the titles of the various early manuscripts of pandas and people. Don't worry about it. It's, uh, you know, I, I sat in the back last night. I couldn't see anything anyway, but that's okay. You'll get able to see the fun stuff. But just to tell you, the titles of these books are very creation sound. First book is Creation Biology, 1983. The second manuscript, Biology and Creation, 86. Biology and Origins, 87. And then in 87, they changed the title of the book to Of Pandas and People. And there are two 1987 manuscripts. Remember that, because that's part of the fun, which we very cleverly hear of called version one and version two. Uh, and then in 1989, the first edition of Pandas and People was published, and then 1993, the second edition, okay? Now, what we did, we got all these manuscripts. One of my guys is a good computer kind of guy. He wrote some scripts to do five-word and ten-word scans all across these manuscripts to make sure we're really talking about this. Yes, we're talking about the same manuscripts. We can demonstrate that very clearly through a uh, manuscript comparison. This is the same book in earlier versions. 
And I thought it would be very interesting to see how many times the word creationism, creationist occurs, how many times does the phrase intelligent design occur? Because the book of Pandas and People was the first time the phrase intelligent design was used in its modern context to refer to this particular Paleo movement. So we did, we counted the words, and we plotted them, and a most interesting thing happened. <laughs> You're probably guessing that the red line is the number of times that the word creationism or creationist occurs in these manuscripts. The blue line is when the term intelligent design occurs. And if I may call your attention to when they cross, they cross in between the first 1987 manuscript and the second 1987 manuscript of the book titled Of Pandas and People. Now, boys and girls, pop quiz. What happened in July of 1987? Edwards versus Aguilard, right? The Supreme Court case striking down creation science. Oopsie. <laughs> All of a sudden, the word creationism disappears. <laughs> Hypothesis, being as we are good empiricists, our hypothesis was that perchance they went through the manuscript and took out all of the words of creationist or creationism and replaced them with the phrase intelligent design. So we tested it, being good scientists, and what we found was in the early manuscripts a passage that read, creation means that the various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings, etc. And in all the early manuscripts, this passage occurs, pretty much as we see it. In the first 1987 manuscript, basically the same passage occurs. Creation means that the various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator with their distinctive features already intact. Fish with fins and scales, Birds with feathers, beaks, and wings. It's, we're going to have a t-shirt with that. <laughs> My friends, this is the missing link. <laughs> and just to, just to be totally redundant here, please note again, we're talking 1987, and you all have memorized now, Edwards versus Aguilar is 1987. Here is the 1987 Pandas and People manuscript number two. Intelligent design means that the various forms of life began to bump through an intelligent agency. Your distinctive features are already intact. Okay, now let's have the chorus. First with fins and scales, birds with feathers, and so on. In William Dembski's witness statement, he mentioned that he was the author of what would be the third edition of Pandas and People, but the name was to be changed. The name of the new edition of Pandas and People was going to be called The Design of Life. And so, since it was mentioned in his witness statement, we subpoenaed it. <laughs> you know it's coming, don't you? <laughs> I wonder, thought we, whether this fish with fins and scales, is possibly in the design of life. Some new agents are the various forms of life begin with their distinctive features already intact all together, the no. Fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers and wings, animals with fur and we, we sort of spent about three weeks giggling around the office. <laughs> Still. 